Hi, I'm James Barnett, and this is my close analysis for Assessment 2 in ACF 106. Wake in Fright is an Australian psychological film released in 1971 and directed by Canadian Ted Kocheff. It is based on the novel of the same name by Australian journalist and novelist Kenneth Cook. Wake in Fright is one of only two films ever to screen twice in the history of the Cannes Film Festival, and in 2009 it was selected as a Cannes classic. The film follows a bonded school teacher, John Grant, as he leaves the rural town he is working in for a holiday to Sydney, where he can meet up with his fiancée. When he enters a town called Bundan Yabba, where the locals attest to it being the best place, instead he starts his descent into a hellish waking nightmare. You think it's worth seeing? <laughs> it's the best place in Australia. Everybody likes the Yabba. Retired film and literary agent Hilton Ambler said it best. Grant partakes in myriad debauched activities that lead to his inevitable physical degradation and psychological breakdown. Today I am going to break down the scene that I believe is John Grant's last step before becoming completely broken. It is a scene that follows the drunken and violent shenanigans at the Outback pub. It is a scene that culminates into a sexual encounter between the two men, which was very taboo at the time. I really feel that it represents the pinnacle of the tension and horror of John's journey. I'll play the clip in its entirety first, and then I'll break down each shot by talking about the technical aspects of the cinematography. This includes the shot sizes, the camera levels, and the lighting setup. I will go on to review the mise-en-scene and what works with the rhythm of the editing. But first, let's see the sequence. <laughs> Let's break this down. Shot one is an exterior establishing shot that moves into a full shot as the subjects walk towards the camera. It sits level with the headlights of the car, which is around hip level. The camera tracks the subjects in the frame. There are two sources of light in this shot, the first being from the moon, which only serves to give a silhouette of the mountains behind. The second and main source being the key light is the headlights from Dick and Joe's car. It is deliberately used to show Doc and John's silhouettes as they stumble towards the shack. The car pauses as Doc is helped up by John. This would have been done deliberately as there is really no other light in this shot. As the car reverses in this shot, Doc falls as though he was using the car for support. This is used to emphasise the extreme drunkenness that is past the point that they are looking out for their own safety. The mountainous silhouette and the extreme darkness display the point that they are isolated and adds to the culmination of John's descent into hell. This shot cuts as they leave the frame on the left. Shot 2 is an interior medium full shot, which sits at shoulder level with the subjects. As Doc and John draw together, the camera moves in slightly, keeping the same frame, and continues to track the action as they mess around and push each other. The key light is coming from the bulb that Doc turned on at the start of the shot, with fill light coming in from behind and overhead of the camera. This way, you can see shadows that are cast behind the subjects. As they move towards the left of frame, there is some more fill light that is coming in through the blind, which adds texture to the shadows on John. The swinging light adds to keep the build of the chaos in this sequence. Doc and John push each other around and continue to drink. 
as Doc realizes that he still has kangaroo testicles in his jacket. He puts his whole blood-stained shirt with the testicles in the fridge for preservation. This disturbing concept is in line with the room in the rest of the shot, as everything within it is filthy and derelict. The camera follows the action, and overall, the shot continues left as it did in the previous shot. Shot 3 is an interior medium close-up of Doc, which sits between eye level and shoulder level. The key light still comes from above and behind the right-hand camera's sight, which validates the continuity of the bulb light. There is also fill light from the left-hand side of the shot. This shot gives us a closer look at Doc and really emphasizes his out-of-control behavior and how far his alcoholism goes. They are doing these things with no regard for the mess. This shot wants us to feel disgusted. The editor cuts on the action of the alcohol pouring on Doc's head. Shot four is an interior medium close-up of John, which sits at eye level. Key light is coming from behind the camera, noted from the shadows behind him. There is also fill light from the left-hand side of the shot, noted by the shadows on the left side of his face. Lastly, there is some fill light filtering through the windows and blinds, which emphasizes the textures that were there in the second shot. This medium close-up of John shows us how out of control he is at this moment, shown to us by the blood-soaked jacket, the frenzied look on his face, and his continued drinking as he pours alcohol on Doc's head. This shot is cut onto the action of John taking a drink from his own beer to maintain flow. Shot 5 matches shot 3. Shot 6 matches shot 2. Even though this shot is the same as shot 2, it really maintains the escalation of their behaviours. Doc shoots wildly around the derelict shack with no regard to the dangers it poses, as John laughs unceremoniously in the background and drinks his drink a little too quickly. Shot 7 is an overlay shot that is tilted upward and is framing the light bulb as Doc shoots it out. After it is destroyed, you can see that there is ambient lighting coming from below. Shot 8 matches shot 2 and 6, but this time there is only key light coming from the window through the blinds. Shot 9 is an interior medium close-up that changes to a medium shot as it tracks the subjects. There is ambient low fill light throughout this handheld shot, but the emphasis is on the key light, which is a light with a shade that Doc uses like a spotlight, which begs the question if this is a callback to their hunting escapades from earlier in the night, and is a metaphor that Doc is now hunting John. Throughout this shot, it cuts back to the light swinging as it casts shadows everywhere. Shot 10 is an overlay shot of the light swinging onto the camera. Shot 11 matches shot 9, Shot 12 is an overlay of the light swinging back and forth. Shot 13 is an interior medium full shot as they wrestle on the ground. Light continues swinging and it escalates the hypermasculinity and sexual tension in the sequence. Shot 14 matches 12, but the light swinging is slowing down. This gives the sequence a very dark and ominous feeling with a hint of anticipation. Shot 15 is an interior mid shot to medium close up as they continue to wrestle. Light continues to swing, but becomes less frequent and frenzied as Doc sits on John's chest and they share a look at each other. This frame could be translated two ways. The first being that in their drunken stupor, they are both consensual of the sexual encounter that is implied at the start of the next sequence. The second is that this look on John's face tells us he is not a consenting party to what is to come. This encounter is what takes John to rock bottom and he indeed regrets it. The editing matches the movement of the swinging light to keep up with continuity. Shot 16 matches shot 10, 12 and 14. Up until shot 9, the camera is on a tripod. The shots stay wide and slowly get closer into the two men. This editing choice manages to build the chaos perfectly in this short two minute sequence. When we get to shot 9, the camera is handheld, giving the shots more of a frantic feel and it stays in tight with the action on the characters. Kochev does this to change the rhythm of the sequence, indicating a drastic change of action. After we are given the Doc hunting John callback metaphor, the camera shots are edited to go between the men wrestling and the light swinging. This adds more to the disturbing anticipation of this part of the sequence, and forms the beat moments for the remainder of the sequence. The scene finally ending on the light swinging into the camera, blinding the viewers, while also functioning as an appropriate transition into the next sequence. Kochev has masterfully used the light in this sequence to display the evil and darkness that is enveloping John in his journey. The swinging light particularly brings out the claustrophobia and sexual tension in the remainder of the sequence. This is not the first time in the film he uses this device, and has it earlier on in the house drinking scene. He uses it to display the chaos that is brought on by the binge drinking. At first glance, this sequence looks like a poorly lit one, but as you analyse each part of its cinematography, you can see how deliberate everything is, even if the characters are out of control. The lighting style in this sequence matches the style of the rest of the film's night scenes. Kochev opts to use minimal fill light to keep these scenes looking as naturally gloomy as possible. This is completely achieved by using little to no backlight to ensure that shadows remain elongated. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the sound in this sequence, or lack thereof in this instance. Apart from the car and the gun, the only sound 
that is used here is what the two actors make themselves. I think the lack of music or other sounds is deliberate. This is to really bring home the point of destruction and lack of moral direction. What we have to remember is this film is essentially a man's descent into a hellish waking nightmare, where he slowly loses grip on his morality and sanity. His slide into amoral behaviour and sexual indulgences rapidly pulls him away from the person he wants to be, or believes himself to be. This is a classic film that has masterfully displayed this. Wake in Fright was filmed on 35mm and has an aspect ratio of 1.85 over 1, which is one of the current standards for widescreen cinema. Even if the Australian box office showed that the locals weren't too impressed with the film, it certainly does paint a polarising and exaggerated snapshot of behaviours that happen to this day. If you haven't learnt anything from this video, please take this one point away. Never refuse a beer in Australia. What's that going to do with a man? I said I'd buy you a drink. You don't have to buy me one. Now drink it down. This has been James Barnett and thanks for watching.